Hello everyone and welcome to 180 Degrees of Impact. My name is Matt Scott and today I'm here with Thomas Fratkin on his graduate on your graduation. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, how's that going? It's going great. Yeah, yeah. besides the weather, but yeah. Yeah, how <laughs> the, before we even get started to like right. introducing you and everything, how does it feel to graduate from GW? It feels really good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I had that job. feeling and yeah. I was like, wow. That actually happened. Like, yeah. wow! I didn't even know that would that would be a thing. So, congratulations, yeah. first of all. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I feel like that's one exciting thing because if I talk to you now, like it's going to be one conversation versus a year from now versus right. you know. So I'm glad I could catch you while you're still like accessible and not <laughs> yeah. uh, overly busy. But just as we get started, for, like I want to know, uh, first of all, how how are you doing otherwise overall? Yeah, no, overall, I'm doing quite well. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've been getting back into meditation. I do that every morning, yes. so 30 minutes of that, stay grounded, be very present. Yeah. Day to day. Um, I'm kind of in a transitional period right now, so I'm graduating from GW. Yeah. I'm going to do a master's in, in neuroeconomics at the University of Amsterdam yeah. in August. So we'll I'm talk kind of about that, for that transition sure. for sure. All yeah. of that. Cool. And so, I mean, just to get started, because you, you did kind of start to get into it. Right. For the 100 degrees of impact audience, yeah. could you introduce yourself? How do you introduce yourself yeah. to people? That's my <laughs> it's a great question. question. Yeah. Um, okay. Hello. My name is Thomas Rackin. Um, I'm the founder of Roundtable Chats podcast. It's something that started kind of just as a passion project where I just really love one on one conversations, going deep with somebody for a long time. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I was inspired actually by seeing a round table at my friend's house, but so I do that um, I finished I did a BS in economics at GW, but I'm also passionate about the brain so neuroscience and economics So I love studying and I like talking to people in depth. That's cool. Kind of what I'm about. Cool. I feel like that is uh, Yeah, I have a lot of questions about that because I'm right. really interested in like what your interest is and you mentioned neuroeconomics econom right. you keep mentioning that like what why? is that? <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, that is the first question. Uh, what, what, but why? What is it and why? Yeah, it's the why piece is really hard. What it is, I've been working really hard to summarize in one sentence. But basically, okay, it's the deepest study of human behavior. And it combines neuroscience, psychology, and economics. It's a very new field. Um, but by the way, I'm keep I'm trying to keep up with you. So like that's what this look is. Yeah, so no. keep keep yeah. going. Yeah, yeah. So I, another good way to explain it is you start with behavior economics, which is a fusion of psychology and econ. And I, I call that kind of the study of why people do dumb things. It's like our biases. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, the psychologist, mm -hmm. founded that and got a Nobel Prize with that. And with neuroeconomics, um, it's kind of looking at the hardware more. So it adds the biology and okay. looks at that. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. So it's like a... It, it, like you were saying, it's com it's in a sense. This is how I'm translating right. it. Like it's combining. I mean, I think of psychology as a, a science in a lot of ways, but mm -hmm. it's combining something that people might not think of as a hard science with the hard science piece right. of it. Okay, I know that definitely didn't sum <laughs> it up well, but like, uh, but yeah, I mean, I I, where did the where did your interest in that? Like, do you know if we go back? Right. Like, where do you think that interest started? Hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's a tough question. I mean, I learned about behavior economics, I think, first reading Freakonomics in the book Predictably Irrational by mm -hmm. Dan O'Reilly. My mom gave me that for Christmas, yeah. and I just was really into it. So I went deep into the behavioral economics literature. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, I just found out that narrow economics is this thing. MIT has a laboratory for that, and I'm like, that's just awesome. <laughs> like, yeah. I never heard of that. Yeah. And then I actually got some positive encouragement at GW. Yeah. So Professor Irene Foster, she told me to go yeah. deeper into the neuroscience and, and do that. So right now, I don't know a lot about the subject. I'll be starting an internship this summer in California at mm -hmm. Claremont University. Mm -hmm. And ideally, I want to apply neuroeconomics into looking into poverty and maybe looking at how poverty can change your brain chemistry even, yeah. and then try to throw in some economics. By the way, someone else I, I interviewed for 180 degrees of impact, uh, she graduated from Claremont uh, University oh, no or college. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. She graduated from there last year, I believe. So okay. that's a connection yeah. uh, we'll make at some point. Yes. But like going, so uh, I feel like just studying business uh, across the street, the right. business school here, which is a fun experience, as we all know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, 
studied, I concentrated in marketing, mm -hmm. and then I decided at some point along the way that I want to focus on social impact. So right. within neuroeconomics and your passion for that, I know that you're, you're interested in social impact. Mm -hmm. Where does, do you know where that interest comes from? I'm going deep, I'm trying to get into, I'm, this is like meta neuroeconomics <laughs> for anyone who's watching, because it's like, let's get down to, let's right. figure out what motivates you. Yeah. And hope maybe by the end of this you'll cry, but that means that <laughs> we're doing a good job. I it's love like, it. I feel like this yeah. is a like two-way therapy. Session. Sure, yes, yeah. oh, excellent question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if I really think deeply about it, my dad's a doctor, and really, I think what it goes back to is even my origin story. Mm -hmm. I can dive into that. So, yeah, please. very unique, very strange. When I was six months old, I was part of the one in a million who has an adverse reaction to a vaccination. So I had the MMR with measles. I'm not an anti-vaxxer by any means. Get no. vaccinated. Again, right. one in a million, right? <laughs> For the other 999,999, right. it's fine. Yeah. You're good. But that happened to be right. So the in the aftermath of that, I was like allergic to 60 foods. My mom had to like grind up this like gray rice paste thing for me to just wow, eat and yeah. live. And then severe eczema, asthma, all yeah. that stuff. And my dad, over the course of a decade, he's he goes deep into kind of Chinese medicine, um, mm -hmm. herbs, acupuncture. He cured me of all those allergies and all that stuff. I didn't take any antibiotics. Uh, you know, can't have any more vaccinations, but. It, it was just incredible. I mean, he was very selfless. And so that was like <laughs> how oh, I man. started. So coming from that, it's like the least I could do is help other people, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really interesting to think about. And so what are some of the ways that you are interested in helping other people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What it's kind of, I've been thinking of micro ways as well. I think a lot of people like Archie want to like really change the world and do macro, but I think yeah. it's good to start micro. Yeah. And one of the biggest things, and I think you do this very well, but it's listening. I mean, really listening deeply to people. It's kind of amazing that if you just, this is kind of why I discovered do my podcast a bit, yeah. but if you just have silence and you just let the person go, I mean, they will really open up. They will really tell you things that they didn't, couldn't tell to anybody, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. please keep going. <laughs> no, it just blew my mind. Yeah, listening, no, it's it's incredibly, incredibly important. Uh -huh. and so that's something I've been working more actively towards, you know, is listening towards people. Yeah, I, that's, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I did want to get to talking about the podcast right. and I'm, I don't, I'm not, totally sure what it is and maybe you could tell me what it is like that's so appealing mm -hmm. uh, what you think is so appealing about the podcast your podcast but for me I just remember I think the first episode I listened to was while I was in Ethiopia just mm -hmm. like a month and a half ago and I was sitting there like whoa this is deep and first of all the Wi-Fi was horrible <laughs> so I yeah. like I knew that I was really interested in the conversation that I was listening to right. because I it took forever to load and it actually took like a couple of days for yeah. me to get to finish the episode right. uh, I think that was the first very first one but since I've listened to a few of the other ones and yeah I'm really interested in why why was it a podcast why didn't you just decide to have conversations with people mm. yeah I mean one thing this goes back to I would always make my guy friends laugh I say like in, in terms of things I really enjoy it's like food sex and then one-on-one -on -one conversations are above that like it's like the pinnacle okay. for me <laughs> it's just it's a very bizarre thing yeah. but I just really love one-on-one -on -one conversations <laughs> and and actually this ties back into the neuroeconomics thing where uh, it's an easy way to get into like a flow state, so mm -hmm. where you lose track of time. Yeah. And um, I've become so fascinated by that where it blew my mind. There's this science writer named Stephen Kotler, okay. and he studies like, he, he looks into the neuroscience of flow mm -hmm. and what's happening. And it turns out part of your prefrontal cortex, what makes us human, where mm -hmm. our morality comes from, the voice in our head, your sense of self, it shuts down. Yeah. So it's like you can't even differentiate yourself from yeah. others, you know? And so when a surfer says they feel one with the wave or the mountain climber says he's one with the mountain or a Tibetan monk says he's one with the universe, yeah. he can't physically from his brain differentiate himself from the universe, yeah. you know? And so um, after learning about that, I kind of was attracted to achieving more flow states. So I can do that through music, through writing, but also mm -hmm. through one-on-one -on -one conversations, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that helped inspire that a bit. Yeah, I mean, it, I, it, there are so many ways to go with this conversation, right. but just thinking about the conversations you have, mm -hmm. 
um, you always start with the question, what are you grateful for? Yeah. And I feel like no one ever asks you that question. That's the right. fun. That's yeah. the, I, this is such a weird conversation because I feel <laughs> like I can relate. Like I ask people so many different questions and right. yet, uh, you know, you don't necessarily get asked them. So I'm curious, yeah. like, what do you feel grateful for just in general, but mm. also in terms of the podcast and what you've created with Roundtable right. Chats? Sure. Um, I mean, I'm grateful that I have the time to do this kind of podcast. I don't have to worry about other things, you know, living yeah. in a first world country. And I mean, I was able to do it very cheaply just with my computer and, and mm -hmm. low budget. But still, the, the, the time piece that I can even do that as a passion project in my free time. I mean, I'm very grateful for that. Um, deeper things, I mean, obviously family, what my dad did for me, my mom. I'm also... I'm also very grateful for the perspective I have. It came from my dad it, uh, was American and my mom's French. Mm -hmm. And so every summer I'd go to the south of France and I would learn through that experience, oh, there's another way to live life. Yeah. I feel very much in America, it's very work-centric and success. When I studied abroad in France, I never knew the French word for success because no uh -huh. one talked about it. They were yeah. talking about dancing and food and other things, yeah. you know, and so forth. But I, I, it was just... I was just very grateful to have that perspective of like how to sit still. That's something mm -hmm. actually I talked in yeah. one of my conversations. And what I'm really, what was, I've been blown away with my podcast and grateful for is how much my guests will open up when I don't yeah. even mean it. Like in episode one, in the first few minutes, he talks to me about how his mom was dead for two minutes. He never told yeah. me anything like that. And yeah. I was like, whoa, <laughs> like, this is just the very it's beginning. It's like, wow, we just hit record. And <laughs> yeah. That's why I was saying it's like a therapy session. I feel like I'm not, I'm not on the podcast now. <laughs> And so it's not, it doesn't feel like that for me, but right. it, it could get there. Right. It could get there. So. Yeah. And, but the other piece of that is it really helps to be there in person with the guests, yeah, I think. So that, so I think my favorite episodes were those I had. I brought them to my house. I would show them the French architecture and, mm -hmm. and the backyard and all this beautiful stuff. Bring them up to the room. There's a nice mm -hmm. round table. There's natural sunlight. And that kind of creates a nice ambiance and people can open up. And those are usually the longest ones as well. Yeah. But doing it over Skype, you know, and things like that, that makes it more difficult, more challenging. I'm curious, like, just thinking about, you mentioned what you're grateful for. Specifically, what are some of those things, uh, what are some pieces of, uh, I don't want to say piece of advice, but things that you would recommend to people to, I guess, to get to this point, like, you, you have a podcast, you have this perspective mm -hmm. based on a bunch of experiences. You mentioned, right. uh, like, spending all this time in, in France, and, like, lots of people, of course, don't have those opportunities, right. so right, right. if you're talking with someone who doesn't have those, what are your recommendations to them, or mm -hmm. what are, what do you tell them to focus on, because they can't focus on, you know, France, or, right. or maybe, they, maybe what they have is a lot more limited. Right? Yeah, um... Maybe even starts with practice before doing a podcast at all, just how you approach people. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times when people are having conversations, they're just kind of planning the next thing they're going to say yeah. instead of listening to what the other person's saying. So, re I mean, really active listening, that is such an important, yeah. critical thing. And letting the person talk. What I noticed observing one key difference between, I think, great and okay interviewers was the great ones would really just let the person talk they would never interrupt them and mm -hmm. it's in those pauses um i was also inspired by humans in new york that was a great one and yeah. when watching when it became videos mm -hmm. he wouldn't even be speaking in it i thought that was really interesting yeah. and i could tell that when um some of the people were interviewed it would come from silence that they would really open up you know, so I mean, it, it's a very difficult thing. I don't know how I could teach it. To me, it's very unconscious, yeah. but um, curiosity is also a very important ingredient. You know, um, I've just always been, I like to say, like allergic to small talk. I'm just, <laughs> it's like not my thing. I'd much rather yeah. approach yeah. someone and say, like, what are you excited about? You know, what do you yeah. want to do in this life? Yeah. What is your story? You know, yeah. let's, let's get deep into that instead of saying, like, I don't know, what, what's your major? That one would always mm -hmm. annoy me at GW yeah. because it'd be a way to classify people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like asking, like, what in DC, the question is off, what do you do? And it's right. like, meaning, like, what's your job? And I've, I've heard, thankfully, heard some people say what do you do for work for it and I mean because you are a lot more everyone's a lot more than yeah. their job and their yeah. their career sure. and what they're being paid to do mm -hmm. um, or even you know I, I was actually thinking a lot about this uh, earlier this week how we're a combination of our actions our emotions and 
uh, some uh, and our thoughts. Like it's not just who I am isn't just one of those pieces. It's definitely not actions. It's definitely not emotions. It's definitely not thoughts. And so there's something to that. But I I like how you're getting getting to this point. We need to ask better questions. Right. Before I well first first of all I just want to know <laughs> yeah. like what are the questions that you really love to ask people when you're doing roundtable chats. Are there any patterns that I should be looking out for when I'm listening? <laughs> yeah, um, well, so it's funny. When I did the first podcast, I had written out in advance and told my guest um, 12 questions, and we went through it. Yeah. And it wasn't as fluid, and so in future ones, I kind of yeah. scrapped that a bit. I mm-hmm. mean, the ones that I kind of keep for continuity is what are you grateful for? Yeah. What is your life story? And as few or as many words as you want. And I realized, like, oh my God, if somebody asked me that, like, <laughs> I don't know how I could yeah. give a condensed version. But it's really interesting yeah. asking that to different guests, their different approaches to that, you uh-huh. know, and how they go about it. Um, it's very bizarre. One I like to end with is, like, what is your most memorable piece of advice you ever received? And that one they usually have mm-hmm. to think a lot about. Um, but it, my, it's funny, my hope with it was to show kind of what human beings have in common, like kind of the humanity and all of right. us, and we're all part of the human race yeah. by having these continuity questions. But each interview has been very distinct, mm-hmm. you know, overall. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to explain. The questions really evolve based on my guest. Um, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. And I, I, just speaking from what I'm doing with 100 Degrees of Impact, I just realized recently, I don't know how many people specifically have interviewed at this point, but I could tell you, I was doing the math recently. Wait, what, like, what's going on? I've had the equivalent of like more than 24 hours worth of conversations oh at this God, point, and they're yeah. all, well, there are a lot, actually, there's a lot in common, which is good, but there's a lot of difference. Mm-hmm. Like, we're just talking now, yeah. and I feel like when, when going back, it just, this is unique. Like, there's right. nothing that this, this is the one conversation conversation we're having right now yeah. and this is the one time that this exact conversation right. will happen and so uh, not to get too deep <laughs> I feel like I'm getting like very meta and but uh, but I think that that's a lot of what you touch on with with your podcast mm-hmm. and actually just looking at it more broadly in terms of impact at, and I know this could probably be hard to see in looking at what you're working on, but do you see any broader importance to like the, just this idea of having these long, deep recorded conversations and then sharing them with the world? Right, so I kind of have two visions. So like the first was trying to get as diverse portfolio of guests as I can, and mm-hmm. that's gonna be a lot easier when I move to Amsterdam. When I do my master's, just a lot more people from different countries. Yeah and just being in a different environment and doing that would be great. Um, the other thing I wanted to try with the round table is to have two, three, or four guests and have challenging conversations. And oh. you know, that's a really <laughs> tough thing to do so, nowadays, so, yeah. you know, and I'd have to be selective with my guests to make sure we're all kind of harmonized, you mm-hmm. know. I like to say the only two rules I'd have on my podcast if there's multiple people is like, tell the truth, be simple, you know. Yeah. Those two are supremely important after you know be 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 aware you know who you're talking to and so that that could be really tricky but i do want to attempt to do that because of how polarized you know the countries become so that you know that was one piece of it yeah i think your perspective is really interesting to me because it's at this uh it's at a crossroads of thinking some people i talk with for 100 degrees of impact are have been doing what they've been doing for decades. Right. Yeah. And it's like, sometimes I'm having those conversations and someone's telling me how they were doing something for 30 years. I'm like, I can't have been even been like alive right. in all that time. Or they're telling me about something they were doing the year I was born or after that. And, but then there's the other perspective that I think is also so important. I think the diverse, diversity that you're saying is important, but uh, you know, someone like you who's obviously like you were saying earlier in a transitional period in your life coming from the student perspective where trust me like you are you're probably more deeply in well actually you're going to study neuroeconomics more and so you'll be deeply embedded in that but like when you're done with school I feel like you don't have like that much time to 
to experience life as a, as a living lab around you. And so, I don't know, I'm really fascinated by your way of thinking. I'm, just as a transition to that, like, what have been some of the biggest challenges in your experience? Like one, and, and I mean beyond the podcast, I just right. mean in now you're about to graduate, yeah. uh, hopefully not on the rainy National <laughs> Mall, but we'll see how that we'll goes. I have my fingers you know, crossed. Not in my control, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, what have some of the challenges been getting to, to this point in who you are, I guess? Yeah, so, man. <laughs> You're like, let me tell you. <laughs> well, in terms of challenges, um, yeah. I feel like I'm very similar to my father in that I, I took this like in-depth big five personality test and it would compare me to like 15,000 other people to it. So there's kind of a quantitative aspect to it. Mm-hmm. And I ranked really, really low in agreeableness. And yeah. I thought I'm like, okay, what's, <laughs> what's, what's, what's here? What's going on here? Let's uh-huh. unpack that. So right. there's two buckets. There's compassion and politeness. Compassion, I was like 70%, but like, but politeness, I was like 2%. So like 98% of people would like more polite than me. So I'm like, okay, how are we defining politeness? Wow. You know, right. that kind of thing. I mean, it was really, uh, you know, striking. So, yeah. um, it turns out they were qualifying politeness as, um, how willing you are to follow authority. Obedience, and so when I looked at that piece, I think that was what I struggled most with school, and and so it's like I, I realized that if things this is something I have to work on personally, but if things didn't go my way, like I, you know, I would I would just I had a harder time yeah going with the flow and with administrative things. So I think I got into lots of conflicts in GW with like advising centers and things like that, even though I love the classes I was taking yeah. and my teachers and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. So kind of like a bureaucracy thing. So on one hand, it's like, okay, I need to, you know, adjust for that and, and adapt to that. On the other hand, it's like, okay, maybe this is something I can use. You know, it can be yeah. kind of a perspective thing where it's like, this is kind of where the herd is going and I kind of want to be orthogonal to that. Yeah. I agree, so, you know, yeah. and go a different direction. It sounds like though that you have a different perspective on something that was so recent really right so where did that shift come from in your perspective where you're thinking like you know maybe i could have handled that a little bit differently uh that's at least what it sounds like to me Mm, yeah one thing is really listening to my body i realized i would be a lot more irritable surprise surprise like if i was hungry you know things like that and there's like a complete link to between stress and hunger Mm -hmm. and so that was a big thing it's okay i need to like take care of basic needs to my garden so whether that's with food sleep you know just just basic things and and just simply listening to my body i think that prevented a lot of more future conflicts and that that was a way to to adapt better yeah i guess it's to build on that as like a younger uh, if you were i was going to say if you could go back and change anything but really i guess the the better question is if you were looking to someone who is uh, like you know i guess in a month from now coming to to orientation at gw Mm -hmm. and or really at any school and getting started what advice would you give them um just based on the lessons that you've learned in your experience yeah i mean a big thing i struggled with was was loneliness so where where you live at gw Mm -hmm. is incredibly important like a a brief anecdote when i was living at west hall in the burn um second semester of my freshman year settings was 2014 there's three suicides in that dorm yeah and like i kind of understood in the sense that to me there's three layers of isolation on Mm -hmm. the burn the burn being from far away from fire bottom west from the other dorms and then within your rooms you're in a single room separated from everybody and so if if you're at the brink and all the elements are there and you you can just lock yourself in that tiny room and at the time there is no mental health center or anything you know on that and it was just brutal and so (laughs) not to scare you know any future no no i think it's important and it's not even a gw specific issue right and i'll i'll say just from my experience to to uh you know, for, for the purposes like of the of the conversation that any GW students like, I was super involved, still in, involved in sexual assault advocacy, mm-hmm. and there's so many things that GW could have improved on, right. and I guess it depends on what you're thinking of, but certain things that GW did poorly, um, just in general, even not comparing to other schools, and like yeah. now I look back and like wow, like 
kids these days, they have it a lot better. Like, it's like, <laughs> now, it's like, oh, wow, on the Vern, they have, like, mental health resources on or Mount Vernon campus, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, it's, uh, you, but you mentioned the loneliness piece, too. Yeah. Um, did you, what, between that, between, like, suicides have happening on campus or like everything else that's going on in the world was there ever anything that was i love my big questions by the way <laughs> it's like opening it up yeah, to like no, really thinking, think, yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. your head's going yeah. but uh is was there ever any point like or anything that happened in your experience that like shifted your mindset Mm. <laughs> that is vague. Yeah, no, it is. But I know. I feel like I could. I, some people I can't ask. Vague. I'm sure I can't yeah. ask. Vague. It's, it depends on the person. Right. I feel like in saying that to you, you go. Like, oh, something came <laughs> up. It, for yeah, me. no. I, I'm trying to. Yeah, I'm trying to see how to approach that. I I, I think after freshman year, to an extent, I don't think I went far enough, but I, I learned to to ask for help more. I thought that was always a critical yeah. weakness of mine, was just not asking for help. So yeah. when I was on the Vern in West Hall, I would always stay in my single room and then just and not reach out to anybody. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, obviously that's very damaging. Yeah. And so sophomore year, it, w it was another kind of problem case where I was in Mitchell. So again, it's like single rooms, you yeah. know, so it's very, that's a ripe environment mm -hmm. to be alone. Um, but in that case, I was fortunate that other people, roommates who were there, you know, they were they were, they were very supportive. Yeah. You know, other people living on that floor, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that made a key difference. Um, also, exercise was also very important. Get into the habit of running and, and playing yeah. soccer and that kind of stuff. Those yeah. could do big things, but. Yeah, I mean, who who you live with or don't live with, yeah. you know, of anybody. I mean, that can really, of course, profoundly affect your college experience. And yeah. I think it's tough as I think for for freshmen. And you know, it, it's it's a tough thing. Like I just today, I was taking the GW kind of senior survey where they were talking about oh, like, would yeah. you recommend this to a friend? Yeah. And would you come back here if you had the opportunity? And it, it, that was a tough one for me to answer. Because yeah. on one hand, I'm like, I didn't yeah. meet great people. I did get a really good economics education, this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But then also, I look at freshman year, and I'm like, man, that was <laughs> that was yeah. really brutal, you know? Yeah. So, but I mean, that's not something that's exclusive you did at GW. No, it happens all over. So no, and like I could say the same yeah. thing. For for me, it was, and it, it's all, it's all, I mean, I was about to say, it's all relative, but like I, one thing I tell people is that everybody has their worst, right? So like you could talk with the person who has the most privilege in the world, for instance, and they have their worst and it feels like they have the potentially hit rock bottom because, mm -hmm. you know, everyone knows, like, if you think of a, again, I feel like this is a very round table chats kind of conversation, <laughs> but if you think of a, like a baby for instance right. like or a toddler like okay. if you take away like a piece of candy from them mm -hmm. they'll freak out and be upset because that's like that's their world that's that universe, piece yeah. of candy mm -hmm. that jolly rancher is their <laughs> world and so uh <laughs> you know i i think it's so interesting that you mentioned that and i'm really i think it's good that we're getting into this mm -hmm. this conversation because so many people you i think oftentimes and you have all these conversations with people um, oftentimes, though, we could have conversations and everything is painted as butterflies and rainbows, and mm. it's just not in the world. There's a lot right. of complexity in people. Yes. Yeah. And again, to bring it back to your podcast, I appreciate that you really go there with people and and, and get in depth. I'm, I'm wondering though if there's not to put you on the spot, <laughs> yeah. uh, even though this whole interview, in a sense, right. is like putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, what is like is there is there a conversation um whether it's like a full interview you've done or a full conversation you've had or is it like a piece of a conversation you've had that stands out to you mm. yeah definitely episode two it's the longest one it's like a two yeah. and a half hour shebang i was talking to a guy i literally just met at a coffee shop for like two minutes that's all i talked about he's a friend of a friend yeah oh and yeah he right. yeah and he, his name is preston yeah. he listened to the first one he says look i want to be on i'm free anytime I'm like all right do you want to be my next guest well, let's just do this yeah again we only talked for two minutes and so like he comes yeah. to my house like i'm skyping with somebody while that's happening and so he just makes himself at home at my house, you know, and I show him around, I bring him up to my room, and I just, I just hit him away. 
and we became like one person. We were so connected. I mean, yeah. in many ways, I was very lucky, you know. But yeah. like, I, I, with him, that's when I kind of threw out all the questions. Like yeah. it was like I asked him, "What are you grateful for?" And then that turned into two and a half hours, you know. Yeah. And like again, insane. about like opening up really soon. What what stood out to me so much about him, like he's from Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. and he was a professional rugby player, and yeah. he was telling me when he changed his identity, and he talked about like how he was in high school and he meditated for the first time is, is rugby captain told him to do this yeah. and mm. he did that and, it, and he said like he, he saw himself die and then come back and he was talking about that yeah. and I'm like oh my god like, I'm yeah. like, like it, it's just there's no uh, <laughs> video you know but my, my mouth is open yeah. and then we just go from there and it was like it was so incredible that experience and it could have kept going i mean yeah. at two and a half i just stopped it because i had some party to go to or i just didn't want it to be too long yeah but we i mean it was just like man this guy <laughs> thank yeah. you like, it was incredible yeah i think i was listening to that one because i remember listening to that one yeah. and i remember thinking to myself what is going on like what this is episode two like that yeah. episode two of, there's not a single episode two of anything that gets that deep until uh, <laughs> like i actually remember that part specifically if i thought about yeah. it more i could probably remember uh -huh. exactly where i was when i was yeah. like, it might have also been that might have also been while i was in ethiopia when yeah. i was listening to that but i feel like it yeah it's that's one thing i love about the conversations you're having because they're they're they go there and they go to places that a lot of people are either afraid of going right especially with someone you just meet in a coffee shop yeah uh, or people that people are uh, like there's a stigma societally against like discussing certain pieces so there's the honesty there yeah. again it's like a, what a therapy session I think <laughs> right. should be yeah. so I don't know if you've actually considered that profession uh, but actually to, I mean, to follow up like what it what is your vision for what you want to accomplish and what you want to do with your time on this earth yeah it's, it's a great question i mean yeah. that that varies a lot yeah. you know um i love to help people in, in a micro sense and then there's also part of me that i want to go deep into research and make some sort of discovery and so um I was, I was talking on LinkedIn with a guy named Dr. Paul Zak, and he's kind of the founder of neuroeconomics, and I hope to have him on the podcast one day. That would be incredible. Yeah. But he is like a pioneer in oxytocin, and the chemical you feel when you hug somebody or see a dog or love somebody. It's like a love drug. And he, he was talking about how the, he explores the connection between that and trust, you know, mm -hmm. and things like that, and helping with companies. And so I'll be working with him this summer at the Center for Neuroeconomic Studies. And so I'm hoping that while I'm there, with all these, you know, great scientists, you know, that will inspire me to do something. I mean, one thing is like, I consider myself both introverted and extroverted. And so I think it's important that I, you know, I cultivate both of them, I yeah. use both of that. So on one sense, I can go deep into the research, but on the other hand, I'm like, I really like talking to people. I really like sharing these ideas. Yeah. So I would love to like go deep with what scientists are doing and then educate that to the masses, you know, and bring that out. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. bring excitement too. Sometimes people can be a bit stiff. I found one person at the lab who was like super enthusiastic, going, "Okay, thank God, <laughs> I have a friend there." You know, I have no idea what that right now is. I, I guess like to yeah. think that that's actually a great point and something I'm really fascinated by. And like we're here at, at GW Science and Engineering Hall, and like there, yeah, I think it's so rare to find people who are, at least in my experience, meeting a lot of people who are doing more technical or uh, brainy, brainy work to find mm. people who are like incredibly outgoing and enthusiastic and passionate. You find a lot of enthusiastic people, yeah. but it just doesn't convey in the same way as you might see it with uh, someone who's more on the creative end. And I think it's really interesting to see you doing something that's like using a lot of different right. approaches. I'm excited to see it. And <laughs> yeah. like, I'm interested in like, some a question that I got from, uh, I don't know if you know Frank says no, but he was the director of the School of Media Public the SPA, oh. School of Media Public Affairs. Uh, like he just wrote a book and released a book I think, last year called Ask More. And one thing he talks about is that there are a number of types of questions, but one of them is the magic wand question. Like if you and so I'll ask yeah, you, okay. like if you had a magic wand to shape your future, and keep in mind this is being recorded, so you're going to be held accountable. Oh, yeah, this, great. Uh, what would your, you know, what would you want to be doing in ten years from now, and what, like why? 
Oh man, Ugh, that's so tough. Yeah, <laughs> that's so tough. Um, and actually, I'll I'll actually reframe the question okay. a little bit uh, as one of my like final questions, and that I always ask in my 100 degrees of impact interviews. Okay. It's that if your life were a book or documentary, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's written in 10 years or in 50 years or 70 years, that's still a possibility. That's still a possibility for us. We could still yeah. be around doing that. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> let's uh, keep our fingers crossed. Uh, but if it, if you were doing that, what would the title be and why? Like, what do you want your life's purpose to be? In a sense? Oh man. Even Imme immediately, question. what a yeah. title that comes to mind to me is how can I help you? That, that's something. This is just this like <laughs> this phrase that really popped into my head. And I think about it all the time. Yeah. A year ago, that really changed my life. Where just anyone I would meet, I would just be thinking with that framework, how can I help this person, yeah. you know? And the amount of doors that would open would be incredible. And I really think if you want to help yourself, you should help other people, yeah. you know? And, and the, the, the compound effect of that is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. In terms of the future, oh yeah. man, it's like, again, I'm like, I'm kind of torn where part of me really wants to go deep into this research and really become an expert on that. Another mm -hmm. part of me, you know, really wants to travel and, and I'm just so fascinated by human beings. And so, really get to the root of who they are. I think the neuroscience piece would just help that to go on a deeper level. And then it's like, how can I, yeah, fundamentally change their lives? Again, yeah, on a, on a, on a micro level. And um, and also record their stories. The, the first guest I had, Trent, uh, we realized like he, he's big on filming documentaries, so he wants to travel and get those stories told. So, um, yeah, no, I want to help people fundamentally, and then there's my passions, which is like writing and music, and you know, I know somehow all this is yeah. gonna to come together. Yeah. I still don't have like a realized finite thing. That's why I like neuroeconomics. I'm like, okay, I can go deep in that because it's so many things. But you know, yeah, we'll stay tuned. I don't know. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> but I guess it just is a fault because you yeah. mentioned like writing and music. That sounds a lot to me like something that, I mean, depending on the space you're in, oftentimes people just call that like your self-care like, mm. and you love doing those things. Could you tell me more about that? Yeah. Your passion for music, your passion for writing, what kind of writing is it? Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I like writing and doing music, anything that's creative. So on the music end, it was piano. I started mm. when I was four years old, went deeply into right. that. And so I love composing on that. And it's kind of funny. It was through my creative writing and music that I discovered in my teenage years. I'm like, wow, this stuff is really dark. <laughs> like, yeah. it's just what's coming out. I'm not consciously even thinking about oh, that, man. you know? And, and, and that was a bizarre thing, but, um, yeah, it's really more creative stuff. I also love uh, poetry and performing mm -hmm. spoken word poetry yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. And these raw experiences, again, going back to the flow thing, yeah. uh, that, you know, that's really important to me. Yeah. But just ways to, to express yourself, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I really enjoy those two things. I feel like I'm, I'm glad. I'm not as, my interviews, for better or for worse, are not as long form as yours, <laughs> right. yours are and don't go quite as deep, but... I'm glad that we had this time because that's one difficulty of asking people questions right. that oftentimes you're not, at, I mean, people ask me enough questions. I feel like I talk enough all the, a lot of the time, but yeah. I'm glad that I had the chance to ask you questions because you're always asking people these deep questions and I don't know, sometimes we just need to flip that on you. Hopefully yeah. more people start asking you quite like, hey, like, what do you think about this question that mm -hmm. you just asked me? And then we'll hear more of that yeah, on the hopefully. podcast, so we'll see. But where can people learn more about you, connect with you, learn more about the podcast? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the easiest place to find me is on LinkedIn. So yeah. just Thomas Fratkin, F-R-A-T-K-N. And then roundtablechats.com is where you can easily find the podcast. Um, and yeah, all the episodes are free. Yeah. Awesome. So I'll tell you, I always do this at the end, and maybe one day I'll reevaluate if it's a pattern. So I'll say to find more about 108 Degrees of Impact, uh, visit www.lets.care, at Let's You Care on social media. Hello at Let's.care is, is uh, my email. Uh, I, I did think for a split second about giving out my phone number. I was like, I'm not going to put it on YouTube. <laughs> uh, but maybe one day yeah. I'll have a special number for that. Right. Uh, so it, it's good talk. It's really good talking with you, and I appreciate it. And do you have any final words, Wis wisdom, words to share for anyone, to, directly to anyone who's watching, oh, I guess? Man. 
I feel like they've like picture that we're at a table, we're at a round table, and yeah. we're having this conversation, and someone else yeah. is sitting there just watching. We have we barely acknowledge them. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious if you have any if you have any thoughts for whoever is watching. Yeah. I mean, it would be this. It's you know, if you have any passion, any passion project um, that you've been indecisive about, or you just don't know what to do, it like just start. Just you know, just do it. Do start small. Do something. Stop thinking about it. Um, that that's really how my podcast came about. Is yeah. I just started. Just start. Do something. And once you start to do something, again to transition to segue to how I end the interviews. Yeah. I always say. Um, well, I always do say thank you. So thank you. I'm really <laughs> yeah. great. One thing I'm grateful for is like having this conversation with you. Um, and we'll talk more, I'm sure. Sorry, people, because I don't have all that much storage on my on my recording device. So uh, that this conversation will end. But uh, yeah, get started and keep impacting. And again, thanks again for yeah. for being part of this. My pleasure. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> no, I'm just staring at it. This is going to be this part's going to be edited out. Yeah.